Welcome everyone. I'm Sharon Fradkin. I'm a longtime member of the League of Women Voters and on the board now. Um, I want to introduce our co-presidents, Joanne Blatt and Robin Zoll. For some reason, I can't see them because I'm seeing Robin Zoll's screen. Um, <laughs> and I would like to not be seeing that. Yeah. Um, however, um, I want to let you know that the League is nonpartisan and it is an issue-oriented organization. And to join the League, go to lwvss.org. Ages 16 to whatever, and I'm the whatever, um, and now any student that's a, in an accredited high school or college can join the League for free. So if you have students, college or otherwise, or, or high school that are in an accredited school, um, and they would like to join the League and do some, some of the people that are helping us today that are League members, the Timekeeper and Genesis, the Question Monitor, and we've gotten questions from someone else. We have a lot of help from, from the students and it's fabulous. So lwvss.org, please. I wanna thank Sydney Forster for timing this event. You don't get to see her face, it's very sweet, but she's behind the LWV sign. And the timekeeping will be pretty important to the candidates, so you'll see it count down on screen. Evan Hoover researched and prepared some of the questions that we used, and we want to thank as well other league members uh, and town folks. Can you get popcorn if you sign up for these things? No. Excuse me? Someone talking to me? Okay. Um, so we wanted to thank Evan for his work on the questions, along with people from the community, and we got some ahead via email. We want to thank um, our member, Genesis Parker, who's going to handle the audience questions. And we want to thank Ellen Penniman from, and SMAC, uh, Stoughton Media Access Corporation, for broadcasting this live so everybody can see it now on Channel 98 on Comcast and 24 on Verizon, and that they will continue to play the recording up through the election on April 6th. So hopefully everybody in town will have an opportunity to see it. I want to let you know how you're going to be able to ask questions. You have a chat feature on Zoom in my computer. It's at the bottom in people's iPads. It's usually near the top. I don't know where it is on the telephones. But you hit that chat and you can type the question. Um, again, we're only accepting questions to that all the candidates will answer. You cannot direct uh, one person with a question. They will all be able to answer everything. So if you have a question, put it into the chat, and Genesis is looking at that, and she will let you know. Eric, you have a question? Yeah, it says chat is disabled. Robin? Robin, are you seeing that? Try somebody else. Well, she's the, she's the host, so she has to do it. I When I went on it, um, I, it looks like I could chat. Oh, it does say disabled. Um, Robin? Robin Zoll? I might have to. Um, I mean, you can. I, I'm going to have to text her, so I'll, I'm sorry about that. But you can do a raise hand and Genesis perhaps we'll call on you, but we wanted her to be able to ask the questions and make sure they're not ones that have already been asked or, you know, directed to only one candidate. Let me, um, let me just uh, text Robin and see what's going on. Sorry. <laughs> Joanne, are you hearing me? We're good now. No, I can, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to the main settings and see what I can do about Okay. Yeah, it's good now. It's good now. Okay. Okay. Good. In the meantime, I will continue. The format for the evening. All candidates, even those unopposed, have been invited. Bob Mullen, who is our current town moderator, is running for another term, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to come tonight because he had to manage a couple of meetings. So, but he is unopposed, and he wanted to send his best regards. School committee and redevelopment authority candidates are also unopposed. However, they are they have come and they will be able to speak for up to two minutes to introduce themselves to everybody. The select board has two seats open 
and four candidates running for those two seats. I won't get into the new news that everybody's talking about, that Christine Howe is moving and there may be a special election. Um, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, and maybe Scott can ask Stephanie and then we'll find out. Um, okay, so uh, the format for the main part of the questioning. There will be two minutes for opening remarks for each candidate. And we have asked them to respond in those two minutes to the following two questions. Why am I running for this office? And what are the primary issues that need to be faced? And then the Q&A will be 90 second responses. And for all of the times, you will see the timekeeper. There are no rebuttals at this forum. And then you'll have two minutes for closing remarks which will allow candidates to rebut any comments they should choose. So I'm not going to introduce our moderator to you. It is Mark Lindy. He's up in my upper right. Raise your hand, Mark, so they know who you are. There he is. And um, he is an uh, adjunct professor at Massasoit Community College. He lives in Bridgewater, so no conflict of interest. And he has moderated for us before and done a great job. Take it away. Yeah, I hope I can live up to that, Sharon. Um, I, uh -huh. It's nice to be on this side of the screen and not a candidate. I've been a candidate before uh, I was on the Southeastern Regional School Committee. So I'm going to first introduce, we have two candidates that are unopposed, uh, one for school committee and one for redevelopment authority. And I'm going to do my best to say the names right. If I um, have a mistake, just please correct me. So first up, we have... Fabienne Francois Morissette, who is running for school committee. And then we'll hear from Reggie Nunnally, who's running for the Redevelopment Authority. So I'm going to start right up with, uh, with uh, Fabienne. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Mark, for introducing me. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for providing me this opportunity tonight to introduce myself and a little bit about my background. Essentially, I'm an immigrant from Haiti. I've been living in the United States for about 40 years. And I have a UMass degree in psychology and an MBA finance degree. I think we lost Fabienne. Hopefully she can rejoin us and we'll come back to her. Um, Zoom today is cursed. I had a class this afternoon and it wasn't working for me either. But uh, um, just so you know, if you want to see the person speaking on Zoom, it's better to bring up the speaker view and then you can see the person that's talking at the time so you can get to know all the candidates. I think what we'll do at this point is go to Reggie Nunnally, who's running for Stoughton Redevelopment Authority. Reggie, you're on. Mark, thank you very much. And I want to thank the League of uh, Women Voters for giving this opportunity to introduce myself to the uh, Stoughton residents. Uh, first of all, um, my name is Reggie Nunnally, and I am running for the Stoughton Redevelopment uh, Authority. Uh, my educational background is that I attended uh, Newman Preparatory School in the Back Bay of Boston. I graduated from Boston College High School and as well as uh, Providence College, and I did my postgraduate work at Boston University, and I was trained uh, at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School at uh, uh, of government at uh, Harvard University. Uh, my highlights in terms of my background and, and experience has uh, been 30 years of experience in economic development, business development, and housing development. Uh, some of my highlights have been the uh, development of the Grove Hall, Mecca Mall, uh, the South End Health Center, uh, the uh, Merengue Restaurant, as well as the Hampton Inn Hotel and the Roundhouse Hotel, as well as the manufacturing plant, all in the, uh, the uh, center of, uh, of Boston. I'm running because I think it is very important to have uh, at this juncture some experience that actually has done this in terms of trying to galvanize all of the various committees in, uh, in the town of Stoughton so that people can work together to begin to get us to the next economic strata. 
with a lot of the resources that will be coming down in the not too distant future, I think it's very important that all of us will be able to work together uh, very transparently so that the uh, uh, residents understand exactly what's going on as we move forward. I believe in the three-legged three uh, uh, stool approach, which is uh, the community, uh, private sector, as well as government. And any one of those uh, legs are missing on the stool uh, means that economic development will not occur. Thanks again. Thank you, Reggie, and good luck to you. Um, I know you're unopposed, but uh, it's always nice when people step up to the plate to serve their community and have some experience to go with it. So thank you for you know, getting into the race. I'm going to reintroduce uh, Fabienne Francois Morissette. We lost her because of Zoom. Something happened, and she's back. So you're up. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Thank you, Mark. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity for you, yourself and the League of Women Voters to introduce myself. Um, I'm an immigrant from Haiti. I have a background, a psychology degree from UMass Boston, sorry, UMass Amherst, and an MBA finance degree from Bentley University. I've been working in audit now for 20 years in the banking industry, technology, and utilities, working with union workers, done several different types of audits, looking at their processes, controls, and risk. I've been a Stoughton resident now for 10 years, and I have two children in the Stoughton schools, one at the Daw School and one at the O'Donnell School, and I've been working with the teachers with regards to one of my son's IEP program, trying to make sure that he's getting the quality education that I want him to get. And essentially, I want to make sure that all kids get that type of quality education. So I want to use my experiences, professional as well as personal, to make sure that they're getting the psychological support that they need and everything that they want in terms of physical safety and um, make sure that we're closing in on any achievement gaps that may exist. I want to ensure that the schools are supported effectively and efficiently by using the budget that we have and make sure that the students, parents, and the community are working together and all of us respect one another in short, to make sure that we achieve the goals that we want to achieve and produce quality students for this society that we want. So far, any questions? Cool. I don't think there were questions. I think you got questions. another. 10 seconds if you want it. Um, right now, as you said, I'm campaigning for the um, school committee member and I have my ads out. And if anyone wants more information, my email is voteforfafa at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook and I have some um, posters if anyone wants signs to post to put out on their lawns. So please reach out and ask me any questions on the social media platforms that I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your willingness to serve. School committee is a really important role. I'm kind of biased because I served as a member of the school <laughs> committee for 11 years. So oh, wow. we're, we're going to get uh, right to the uh, selectmen's race. That's the contested race in this election. And uh, we're doing the opening statements alphabetically, and then we're going to randomly uh, select. We have about 15 questions, and then we have some audience questions that were submitted as well. So I'm going to just in, I'm first going to state the names of all four of the candidates um, that are running for selectman: Scott Carrara, Stephen Cavey, David Lurie, and Jared Rose. OK, and you get to pick two of those candidates to be on the Stoughton Board of Selectmen in the upcoming after the election. So I'm going to start with Scott uh, to do his opening statement. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Professor Lindy in the residence of Stoughton for giving me another chance to be here again. I'm a lifelong resident of Stoughton, class of 79. We graduated the, last, the largest class in Stoughton history. I'm married to Stephanie. She's the newly appointed town clerk. I can offer my experience, knowledge, and integrity and swift decision-making for the residents of the town. And this is what they vote for. It's the leadership and the service to Stoughton that I have given on boards and commissions and elected positions that speaks volumes. Some of the issues I'd like to straighten out would be the problem of not giving the firefighters, the men and the women of this town, a new fire station, not a glorified headquarters. They already have a headquarters. I'm talking about a fire station. I was 
instrumental in bringing the armory on board for these people to have as a fire station. It's been sitting there since 2007 when I secured it. I'd also like to be proactive in partnering with the school department of the town in their uh, endeavor on the South School. You know, it's easy to spend money. Sometimes there are too many irons in the fire. Understanding people in the makeup of our town leads the way to prioritize what's right for the town. I served nine years before on the Board of Selectmen. I don't need any consultants to tell me how to pick anything or to do anything. I run a business. It's been in this town 60 years. It's as old as me. My dad started it. I've been a boss a long time. Didn't want to be the boss, but I had to. I just want to say, I know what it takes. I show up, I produce, and that's all that I worry about is what's best for our town. My decisions are made strictly for the residents and the voters of this town. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. Class of 79, you and I share that, but that's <laughs> not gonna give any advantage to anybody. It just means we're close to 60. Okay, let's go to Steve Cavey next. Steve. Thank you very much, Mr. Lundy. I appreciate it, uh, the introduction. Thank you for moderating this. I'd also like to thank the League of Women Voters. Uh, as I mentioned before we started, uh, our town used to have several uh, in interviews and also debates, and uh, we no longer have those. This is this is the single uh, way to meet all the candid candidates and uh, and their work in this field and in, in getting this information out is, is really instrumental for our democracy. Uh, to that same end, I'd also like to thank the other candidates, uh, Mr. Rose, Mr. Carrera, and Mr. Uh, Lori. Uh, yeah, it, it's, I am currently an incumbent, but I, I have such a huge respect for the democratic process and the uh, opportunity for people to uh, explore different ideas uh, and, and make this choice. So thank you for running. I, I appreciate it from all of you. Um, so my background, I have a background in uh, uh, undergraduate degree in philosophy and history, math, and sciences with minors in comparative literature classics. Uh, I went on to, to study it at uh, Harvard's Extension School, their evening school, and received a, 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 a master's in, in management with a focus on finance and controls. Uh, I also uh, am extremely proud to take classes every single uh, semester at Massasoit. I, I, I do that. There's always something new to learn. There's also always something to, uh, to explore, something you didn't know, and it all comes in handy. So uh, try to be a lifelong learner. Um, the reasons I'm running is I want to continue the work that I've been doing. I think that we, we've made some really uh, helpful changes to the, to the way that, that uh, the management of the town is, is, has, uh, uh, has gone. We, we've, we've brought in a, a town manager who does excellent work uh, and has, has uh, I think, is leading our town uh, very efficiently, very effectively. Um, looks like I'm already running out of time, so I'll move really quickly and just say that I think the most important issues that we're facing right now is a, a recovery of uh, from post-COVID, where we go from here, uh, it's going to be very important with regard to economic development uh, and securing the tax base. I've run out of time, but I thank you very much for your for your time. We will get you. I'm sure you'll get time, and you can weave it in to the answers and the questions when we go through um, the forum here. So next up is David Lurie. David, welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Lindy. I, I want to make sure I get the thank yous to not only yourself, but the League of Women Voters, uh, the fellow candidates who are running. And uh, But I also want to uh, make a, a, a thank you uh, out to the volunteers who live locally in Stoughton who support my candidacy. They pour their heart and soul into, into helping me, mostly because not only they know who I am, but they also believe in, in my message and, and the kind of changes that they believe should happen in Stoughton. There's no dependency in my campaign from any statewide you know, partisan group. There's no national influence at all. I'm just a local uh, resident here, you know, looking to try to take what I've learned working locally in our municipal committees and, and, and so forth and town meeting to try to get the town moving forward without harming anyone. So my message is really about not whether or not we have to take on big, big challenges, big projects, move the town forward, but it's also in the way we do it. Are we gonna do it in a way that harms the people who live here already? 
or and try to find new people to replace them or are we going to be looking to to find an affordable way to move forward i spent four years in the finance committee i spent 98 percent of my time attending my meetings to not only to learn about what's going on in stoughton but i went further to actually attend the uh, massachusetts municipal association the mma to learn about taking the things that i learned as problems in our town and find the solutions that are available with not only our town meeting uh, form of government, but also with the Prop two and a half. Proposition two and a half has been around since the early 80s. And I want to use the knowledge that I've learned to help make it sure that nobody gets harmed moving forward. So I respectfully ask for your vote to the public who's watching. And uh, here I am to uh, represent you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And our fourth candidate for select board is Jared Rose. Jared, welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Lindy, and uh, thank you to the league for hosting this. Um, you know, I'm running for this place on the board because I want to uh, work together with all of our citizens to really try to build a better Stoughton for all of us. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've really seen kind of, even despite the pandemic and all its challenges, um, some really positive changes in our town, uh, political leadership and the direction that we've been going in. Um, you know, I'm a green certified realtor. I'm a former state senate aide, the co-chair of our cultural council and a member of our town meeting and the historical commission. Um, I think these experiences give me kind of an intimate understanding of some of the issues that uh, Stoughton will be facing over the next few years. Um, these include, you know, the state's about to put a mandate on us um, for how we're going to generate our uh, our energy. And so how we're going to um, become a carbon neutral town, uh, how we're going to be able to handle affordable housing for every income level, and how we can build better uh, and more transparent constituent services at town hall. Um, I think my uh, experience, you know, lends itself to this work. And uh, I look forward to working with you all together for the next uh, three years. Thank you, Jared, very Thanks, much. Jared. So now we're going to get into the questions. And like I said, we're going to mix these up. We're going to do a random order. That way everybody gets a fair shot. And I just want to thank all of you for putting yourself out, whether you're currently serving and, and are looking for re-election or you're looking to serve and your past service. It's very important. That's what keeps the town going. So first off, we're going to start with a financial question. And I'm going to start with Jared. Um, how would you, as a select person, manage our debt for future needs share your philosophy in general about finance and debt and remember to unmute myself <laughs> um uh well uh so thanks for the question um i think that my my general philosophy about um you know spending in debt is uh that you know government kind of exists to serve the public, right? That's the that's the ultimate goal. So we need to really be have kind of a focus on how what what our um, what our priorities are, how we're going to address them. Uh, you know, honestly, uh, for Mr. Carrera, I agree with you about the South School and the fire station, um, and uh, looking at how that's going to happen. Um, so I would. Uh, I think that we have a big priority with a lot of our buildings that are going on in town um, between the needs to uh, renovate and rebuild some of them, uh, looking at that, but, but particularly just a focus on how we're going to um, really make sure that our funds are really uh, addressed um, for the public good as much as possible. Thank you, Jared. Uh, same question for Scott, and I hope you guys don't mind me using first names. It's just a little less formal, and of course, we're on Zoom. So Scott, how would you as a select person manage our debt for future needs? And if you could share your philosophy in general about finance and debt. Thank you, Professor. Um, I don't mind you calling me Scott either. Every, everybody does. Um, I'm in my last waning weeks, not months, not years. I'm in my last waning weeks of being on the finance committee for nine years. I can't even believe it's gonna be over 
April 30th, but it's done. I've served nine years on that committee. We have managed, and prior I have managed really, really tough, tough budgets. Priority is the key to everything. You have to look at what we should be purchasing and what we should be fixing. I know everybody wants to fix everything. We get these master plans and it looks great on paper. It's collecting the taxes. It's maintaining the services to the town first. It's the buying of the, I hate to say this, it's the buying of the toys that kind of stop. It's got to stop. We have a lot of equipment. We're the envy of the South Shore. We have to get the spending under control and then we can manage all the rest. Bringing business comes in on its own, believe it or not, you can't chase it because sometimes you chase it away, but they know what they're doing. You work with them when they come in and that's how you manage your budgets. You have to know what side is right and what side's wrong, how much debt inside the budget and outside the budget. It's hard, it, you couldn't even do it now. You have to be in finance to understand that term. Thank you, Scott. Uh, same question um, for Steve next. Um, how would you, as a select person, manage our debt for our future needs and share your philosophy on finance and debt, please? Sure. So uh, as far as just planning for the future, uh, the uh, under the, the, for the last three years, uh, as I've been on the board, we've developed a, a way of tracking debt uh, as it rolls off and, and, uh, and, and making sure that, that any new purchases uh, when we make them, uh, that there's also debt coming off at the same time. So we're essentially uh, replacing our, our debt service with uh, with new debt. And uh, so we know we can maintain it. Uh, having no debt is, is obviously not 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 good either. We, we, in order for us to get the credit rating that, that we have, uh, which is quite high, uh, we, we need to uh, have a revolving debt. So that, that I think I feel pretty comfortable about that, not revolving debt, but, but uh, uh, bonds. Um, so I feel comfortable with what we're currently doing, tracking it and uh, planning accordingly, and we're using that essentially to budget. As far as uh, debt, uh, general philosophy about it, um, you know, we do have a lot of buildings, we have a lot of uh, property. Some of them uh, may be extraneous, but but uh, given the nature of uh, at least what I've seen, there's not as much as people might might think. Uh, they're very expensive. We have uh, several schools all built within a couple of years of each other. Uh, a decade, uh, and they are all past their useful life. And we have a lot of expensive uh, projects that we need to, need to look at, including uh, the fire station, which is absolutely critical. Uh, finding, uh, developing uh, a new, getting, or getting new economic development is critical. We've been able to do that by having the uh, uh, sewer go, go down Park Street. We we're already seeing expansion because of that. I know my time's up, so I'll stop there. But I, th I thank you very much. Hey, thank you. And uh, David, same question. How would you, as a select person, manage our debt for future needs and your philosophy on finance and debt, please? Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, our town does not have a financial policy statement. We have a debt statement that we've showed to the bond markets, which shows purely, will we not exceed a 10% of our budget debt? We, and we do that, and it's, it's fairly small. On the other hand, three times as much of our, our debt that we have is in outside self-funded places like debt exclusions for the high school, the library, um, other, other aspects of things like CPA funding. The problem that we have is that number one, we have projects that are out of control. We over-engineer everything we do. Now we love our high school and it was worth making a big deep investment in the high school as a centerpiece for the town but we have to get a handle on how much engineering we're willing to put in all the future projects that are coming down the pike like the, like the ones that were mentioned earlier the the other aspect is is that the departments have to understand that if they want to have pride in the same town and some of these people even when they live halfway to rhode island they they take pride in the town as well because they work here they need to make sure that within the budget, there's room for us to borrow so that we're not hitting the residents with the debt exclusion and overrides. The town has had enough overrides and debt exclusion. We don't need any more. We have to get a handle on it so that we can share the responsibility across all those constituencies I said. Okay, that's my philosophy. 
Thank you, David. And uh, we do have an audience question, and uh, Genesis is going to um, ask it for us, and uh, I will tell you the order that you're going to go in. So go ahead, Genesis. All right, the question is, the armory was looked at years ago to house the cable studio, and it was really a mess, very wet, moldy. So how would the cost of remediation factor into that as location for a fire station, given that the last fire station was unusable for years and maybe even spilled due to environment, environmental issues? Okay, so I'm gonna start with David on that question. That was, I, it was hard to hear. So on the armory, it, used, it was looked at before, can you help me understand exactly what you meant by the, the use of the armory? Because um, I couldn't get the end of it. The cable studio? Yeah, I you... could not hear the question, Mark. I'm sorry. I'm going to try okay. to. I think, I think it's something with Genesis's mic. It's really soft. Yeah, it's it, OK. You can know I what? turn the volume up to see if that helps? Genesis, can you try one more time? A little louder, if you can. The armory was um, looked at years ago to house the cable studio, and it was really mess and wet and moldy. So how would the cost of remediation factor into that as a location for the fire station, given that the fire station was unusable for years and maybe even still due to environmental issues? Did you hear that better, David? Yes, I did. A matter of fact, there was a study done. Thank you for that, Genesis. The uh, the pro we actually hired a consultant to, to go through the building to do a feasibility study on exactly what would have to be done to bring it to occupancy. There would have to be remediation for just the things you're talking about. So it is a very good question. So the core of the building, when you look at the larger, you know, I believe it's like a, maybe a three story building, possibly two to three stories. The gut, the, that, is, that armory section is very, very, uh, sound. It's great bones to build off of for a future building, whether it's a fire station or in a per, or any other for that matter. And usually what you have to think about is that section you're referring to in the front in having that removed and get to the core of the building, because that's really where the value of that space is. And by the way, it's, a, it's about a 70 year old building. However, it was built so strong as an armory you'll get at least 100 to 150 more years out of it. So instead of thinking about it as something that has to be torn down, you should really start thinking about how you can take advantage of the, the strong infrastructure available in the core of the building, getting rid of that, that wet area that you're referring to on that short side of the building, because that, that has to be ripped off. So it's a very large space to, that could be used as a fire station and without getting too grandiose with making it a headquarters, you can make it a very usable fire station that the firemen would be very proud to work in. Okay, we're gonna to go to Steve with the same question. Steve, are you comfortable understanding the question? Yes, I am. Okay. So I'm just gonna begin by saying that, that uh, uh, whether or not the armory site will be used as a fire station is still uh, hasn't been decided. Right? There's, there are a number of sites. Uh, we, we have a, a public safety building uh, committee that, that is working through the, uh, a lot of these questions. Uh, right now, the armory is probably the strongest site, but they still, as of right now, don't feel confident that, that that's gonna ultimately be uh, the recommendation. So I just wanna put that out there ahead of time. When we've had this, this building look at, looked at in the past, uh, you know, I'm sure these numbers have changed since I started. Uh, every year, things get more expensive, but uh, I think two or three years ago, we, we had uh, we, we ran some estimates to see how much it would actually take just to get the building shored up so that it, it was uh, clean and uh, watertight, and that it was roughly a million dollars, uh, probably more than that now. I think that, uh, that that doesn't seem like a lot of money um, in the grand scheme of getting a building up and running, uh, and I would sure like, like to see that something like that happen for some purpose. Uh, so far, there has not been an appetite for, from anybody to spend a million dollars without uh, a certain use for that building. A fire department might be it. But when we bring this the same question of, of, of just rehabbing what we currently have to our architects, uh, they recommend against that uh, and said favor uh, demolition, which would be overall less less uh, uh, expensive. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna have to go with the experts on this one. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're gonna go to Scott next. Scott, are you comfortable with the question? Yes, I am, Professor Lind. Um, 
I was the one who uh, secured the armory. It was taken for a public safety building. It was never going to be used for anything else because if we didn't, it had to resort back to the state's ownership. That's in the deed. I was there when the stuff was pulled together, and it's not a problem. We ripped the library to its skeletal core and built it all back in for $14 million. We're only on the hook for seven. This place would make a fantastic fire station. I don't understand why the consultants or the architects of the work, and it's very easy to start, rip things down and go with the uh, boilerplate, slam it in new. I think that the board took a vote four to one to put a fire station there for the firefighters, men and women. It's time to do it. They've been banging this thing around for three years from site to site to Louisiana, land grab of the school department property. It's getting ridiculous. It's time to move forward and do the right thing. That armory was just taken to make the armory a fire station, not a community center room in it, not this, not that, not the other thing. I'm just sorry to be rough about it, but those are the, that's the history and that's the truth. Forced to go someplace else only drags out time that those poor firefighters got to stay in that station one. It's not fair. And to have any indecision is is very sad. Thank you, Scott. And Jared, you. are you comfortable with the question? Yeah. Um, well, I think in some ways we're all in, in agreement. Um, it, the current plan right now, the public safety committee hasn't really come up with their final solutions it does seem like the armory is the best option um out there and uh you know i say this again i agree with scott <laughs> um uh for um for uh really looking at at having the armory be a key location for the next fire station okay we will go to the next question, um, and I'm going to go back to finances. Um, right now, did you know that Stoughton will receive almost $3 million in federal funds from the COVID-related Rescue Act? Other than cutting taxes, which may not be allowed, what do you believe is the best use of funds for Stoughton? And I'm going to start that one with Steve. Thank you. Uh, investing in, in infrastructure, uh, I think, is, is, is really the key. Uh, we, as, as I mentioned when we first started uh, this debate, that, there were, that we have been able to uh, uh, you know, work with town meeting to, to uh, agree to, to fund a sewer down Park Street, and that has already seen uh, huge benefits for us. Uh, we, we've had seen expansions of companies down that way, and there's interest in, in putting additional work down there. If you head down a couple of Park Street, you'll probably notice that there's a uh, scattering of businesses here and there, some warehouses and whatnot. Uh, and then you hit the Brockton line uh, and then all of a sudden there's, there's all of this development. Uh, that's the, the, the reason why there's no development on the other side is because there's no sewer. Uh, and we can get a lot of economic development uh, just by putting a sewer down that area. Uh, and I would, actually our, our economic development uh, coordinator has been key in this. Uh, uh, our, our, Town engineer, Mark Tisdale, has done an amazing job uh, providing people the information they need for this. But any any money that we can put towards economic development is going to help us in the long run. We have we have a what's shaping up to be a, a real uh, 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 revenue issue uh, coming up. It's 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 significant. We have uh, um, you know our population is getting older, uh, and more of the tax burden is, is being is really being pushed towards these residents. Uh, towards people who are who are on their way towards a, a fixed income, we need to move that away, and we do that by creating uh, more economic development. Okay. Next up is going to be David on the same question. Stoughton's going to receive almost three million dollars in federal funds from the COVID-related Rescue Act. Other than cutting taxes, which may not be allowed, what do you believe is the best use of funds for Stoughton? Yeah, the, the challenge with our town, and it's just like many towns in the state, because some towns will go out of their way to shore up problems in their budget so that when you do get revenue coming in, it actually has an impact. There's other towns who have total contempt for revenue, and they say, we can't, we can't tax our residents enough. And those, many of them are inside the 128 Beltway of Massachusetts. 
Stoughton is in the camp of let's just leave everything, you know, totally up to others instead of getting control of the cost to running the town. We just let it go run away spending all the time. So I look at it like a bucket. We have the bucket where revenue comes in through the top. And when the revenue get, goes into the top, it falls out through the bottom in a hole. There's a hole in the bottom of our bucket. When you add more revenue to that bucket, it just makes the hole bigger. It doesn't create an impact for the town. So what I'm trying to do and why I'm running is to shore up that leaky bucket so that when we do find revenue coming in, it'll have a, an immediate impact on the things that our town needs, like the infrastructure that was mentioned, the big projects that are coming down, you know, with fire stations and buildings for the school department and, and the police and everything else. So it's about making sure there's impact with the investments that we make by shoring up our budget. And there is a way to do that. I've studied it through the finance committee. I spent many hours studying this, and this is the kind of um, policy building that I would do and get consensus over within the select board. Thank you. Thank you, David. And same question for Jared. Uh, Stoughton's receiving three million, almost three million dollars from COVID uh, rescue funds. And what do you think is the best use of those funds for Stoughton? Yeah. Well, I think uh, that that a huge chunk of it has to be into our um, infrastructure, right? Uh, like Steve said, uh, really trying to plan out some of our sewer systems so that we can really build our economic development. Uh, I think we also have to take a serious look, like the state's about to mandate that we go carbon neutral by 2035. Um, so I would like to look at how we um, are powering some of our town buildings and how we can do that in a uh, way that meets that mandate, first of all, but also saves us money in the long run. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of grants that you can also do for that, a uh, wide variety of stuff. Um, but between really trying to save the town money through that program, also building our economic development base, I think that that, that long term really kind of helps uh, build our town's um, uh, economic vitality and, and health uh, impact, uh, rather tax impact. Um, and uh, that's what I would do. Okay, thank you, Jared. And last, uh, Scott, uh, what would you do with the $3 million in COVID relief funds for Stoke? Uh, we, were, we were told the other day at finance that the town was going to have from the town manager a windfall of $2.5 million on the COVID relief funds. Those funds have to be used. They can't just be taken out and say, we're going to go build sewers, we're going to put roofs on things. Those are directly for impacts that COVID has had on certain situations in town, like um, if certain buildings needed to be retrofit with um, uh, air handling systems, or if they had to uh, do something else at the school department to make sure that the children were safer and stuff. I'm not sure if you guys understand if this is the what I'm hearing. We didn't hear that we were getting any $3 million. We knew it was 2.5. And the town, um, she's not the accountant, she's the financial person. She has to vet these things in so that they're accepted by the federal government to say that, yeah, you can spend that money that way. And just to touch base on the self spoken sewer, the reason why it was split in half was because the piece that's going to Brockton was gonna cost substantially more than the way me and Mark Tisdale sat down and decided to go. That, a lot of wetland issues down there. You're not going to build big buildings and go crazy and get a lot of money. There's big issues down there with water, and we wanted to do what was best for the residents, so we decided to go to Campanelli first. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go over to Genesis with audience questions, and I'm going to take a brief break, and I will be right back. The order for this question is going to be Scott, Jared, David, and Steve, and I sent that to Genesis on the chat. I will be right back. Thank you. All right, the next question is, what would you like to see done with the train station? Would you like to have part of the station being available for commuters who are waiting for the train? And that goes to Scott. Thank you, Genesis. I'm glad uh, somebody's touched on this because we bought the granite elephant, that's the train station. 
we bought the white elephant, which is the Randolph Savings Bank, and we buy things and we have no idea what we're going to do with it. So we send out a blanket across the town. What would you like to see done with this? I would like to see the train station return and resort back to something that the train people could use as a stop. It's sad that it doesn't have a lot of parking spaces if you went to do something privately with it, like somebody says a restaurant. There's a lot of struggling restaurants. We don't need to overwhelm them. There's residents that own their own. So I think we should just make it a train station again, get out of the weather, get warm. But don't forget, we have that South Coast Rail coming. That station will probably just be a showpiece when they go flying by and they end up down the Raynham dog track where Mr. Connie owns. And that's going to be one of the biggest viable stops. And you'll probably pull most of the people out of Stoughton going that way are going to want to park and eat dinner, eat breakfast. It's going to be a happening place. Stoughton, it's going to just be like a pass through. I don't even, they promise you everything and, and it doesn't come true. But I do, I would like to see it be a, a stop again, somehow, some way. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it would absolutely be wonderful to have it be a, a viable, usable building, right? Um, my wife takes the uh, takes the train every single, well, before COVID, takes the train every single day into work. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of places to get out of the rain when it's very crowded. So even having a, a open building that you could use as, for that structure would be a uh, benefit to to uh, folks. Um, we can, I think there's been a lot of discussion about different uh, options like uh, a restaurant, a coffee shop, a, a whole wide range of things. Um, I think that we can come up with a solution for it, um, for for what, what the board actually wants to do with the building. I mean, I would really like it to be used at, at minimum to just be uh, an open area with maybe uh, you know, some coffee, some snacks for, for folks um, uh, going forward. Genesis, you can, you can finish this part and I'll come back for the next question. All right, now it's over to David. Do you, do I need to repeat the question? No, I've got it, Genesis. Thank you so much. You've been helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so First of all, to bring the railroad station up to code so that you could actually bring occupants in there, I think it's the estimates I've heard are upwards of one and a half to two million dollars. There's a lot of structural issues and utilities that have to come into there before you even introduce any programming ideas for that building. Now, having said that, I, want, I can't emphasize enough what was said by a previous speaker, Mr. Carrera, who said there's going to be a South Coast Rail. Well, you know, not only is there a South Coast Rail that we've been actually uh, spending a lot of money, $150,000 a year on legal fees to try to block or get mitigation from all the impacts that are going to happen from an extra track with all these freight trains coming flying through. So I think the alarm has to get sounded because right now they've, they've dredged out Fall River and they've actually started construction in phase one all the way up to Middleborough. I started looking at the OCPC uh, uh, work that they're doing. Stoughton is next on the list, phase two. And you know what they put at the top of it? It says Stoughton Electric at the top of the website. You know what that means? They're gonna be putting in stanchions. If you remember the old erector sets, maybe I'm showing my age too much, but there's those, those metal structures that are gonna get propped up with an extra track for trains that are gonna come flying through. My idea would be to put in an oak box theater. I had a, a great idea in which we can leverage that space to show how much demand there is for fine arts in Stoughton. And my idea would be to demonstrate that with a reasonable size theater. The charm of that building is spectacular. And I think you, um, showing the, the uh, region how, in, how good we are about uh, filling up uh, for uh, theater shows and, and comedy and everything else, it would be a terrific use for that building. But it's gonna take a lot of work to get to the, to the stable building and the South Coast Rail. And finally, over to Steve. Thank you. Uh, so, I just want to correct one thing. Uh, 
South Coast Rail is not definitely going to happen. We, we're still ready to, to fight that uh, to the extent that, that we're able to. State might win. Uh, but I w I'm not going to plan how to use a building on what may happen uh, sometime in the future, especially with, with the, the, the fight that our town has is going to put forward towards uh, preventing that. The, um, uh, for me, I had two, two objectives as we were uh, negotiating the purchase of the building. One is just to secure it, uh, to essentially protect it. And uh, we, we succeeded in doing that. We, we were able to do that with a uh, significant amount of help from our congressional delegation. Uh, we've also been able to, uh, 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 you know, work with town meeting, and they were were able to help us quite a bit. Uh, and um, the uh, CPA, the uh, CPC, Meeting Preservation Committee, uh, also put a lot of money into, into this as well. So there's a lot of people involved who wanted to see this succeed, uh, and we were able to to do that. So we, we secure the building. The next is for me is to activate it. That's what we're really talking about now. Well, how do we want to activate it? It's important that people can access it. Uh, even during the time that it has not been used, we were able to uh, to uh, work with uh, Boston Film uh, Office to get it uh, used as, actually as a scene in the movie Little Women. Uh, we uh, uh, what I would like to see ultimately is something that people can use it for on a daily basis, and uh, we put an RFP out. There's, the interest tends to be towards something like a brew house or uh, a restaurant of some kind. Uh, though there are some nonprofits that has suggested other uses, and I think the idea of a theater is, is an excellent one. Okay, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Genesis, for filling in with filling in for me and uh, asking the questions. I'm going to go on to um, a general question about communications with residents. Okay, do you agree an improved town website could be a tool for resident communication? If so, how could this happen quickly and how much of a priority is it for you? Give other ideas for improving communication with residents as well. So we're gonna start off with Steve. Sorry, would you mind asking, asking the question one more time? Sure, um, we're talking about communicating with residents. Um, do you agree that an improved town website could be a good tool for resident communication? If so, how could this happen quickly and how much of a priority is it for you? Give other ideas for improving communication with residents as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the, a a uh, functioning website for the town is, is absolutely critical. Uh, that, that's something that we, we have prioritized uh, in our discussions with the, the town manager. I, I believe it's also part of her uh, performance evaluations. So we've tied it very much to, to her, to her, her um, uh, performance with the town. Uh, and this is something that the, that uh, will ultimately I believe, fall in the town clerk's office as well. It's something that we will prioritize with her. I know that uh, Ms. Carrera, uh, uh, who, who was just recently uh, awarded that job, uh, also takes it very seriously, which I'm very happy to see. Uh, even to this day, as I, as I look through the website, I'm still finding uh, information that cuts off at 2013. I don't know what happened in 2013, but uh, everyone took it pretty seriously until the middle of 2013, and then they just stopped updating things. Um, and that, that really has to stop. This is the single access point for, for most people, uh, how they access information about our towns. Uh, it's how I access uh, information. If I wanna know what the minutes are from the town I don't call the office, I go to the website. And uh, it's frustrating to, to see that a lot of these things aren't updated. Um, uh, we're working towards also getting the, the bill paying uh, to the extent that we can uh, online as well, because that's how people actually live their lives now. Uh, and showing up and dropping a check off at town hall is not uh, in most people's plans. Uh, they want to be able to find a way to offer it quickly. So it's top priority, and I, and I, I think we can do it within a, a short amount of time just by, by really uh, storming the problem, getting as many people involved uh, as necessary to, to get this done as quickly as possible. I know there's a lot of information already available, a lot of templates we can use uh, that will allow us to do that quickly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And same question, uh, Scott, about the town website, uh, used as a tool to improve resident communication and um, if you have any other ideas about communication. I think I think websites are becoming the, the, big, the big thing of the future, but some people like to see paper in their hands I'm not sure if that's a viable option. It costs money to mail stuff. But what I really think is, I know that the website and everybody talks about it being here, being there about town hall and stuff like that. I think 
more people are hooked up with SMAC and their local channel. I think SMAC should, you know, they put a lot of information on, but I think they got to dedicate something um, quarterly or monthly would be better. We play, we pay good money for the, for SMAC. And there's a gentleman there, Mike Hammond, who does a great job at doing everything. I think there should be something on there that people can watch it go by at a certain time, maybe almost like the six o'clock news time or, or maybe earlier so that they can see what's happening in their town, what has to be done. Your dog license are due here too. Not everybody has a computer, especially the older people. They're trying to pay their taxes. They don't, they're not investing in computers. They rely on their neighbors to come check on them sometimes. You can't believe how many people still go to the town hall to pay their taxes in hand. It's a big thing to them to go and see it, leave their hands into the hands of an employee. So websites are nice, but person to person is great. And um, I can't talk about the clerk's office, but um, I know a lot about it, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Jared, same question. Are you good with the question? Could you repeat it one more time? Well, basically, uh, dealing with communication, uh, whether the town website could be improved or is a good tool for resident communication, and any other ideas for improving communication with residents. Yeah, so so my background is kind of as a coalition and consensus builder, right? So one of the things that I'm really focused on is exactly this. Um, now, there are residents uh, particularly older residents who, you know, uh, aren't very computer savvy uh, and do need stuff, you know, mailed to them or um, or uh, done in the, uh, on paper. But by far, more and more and more of your residents are going virtual. Um, so what we need, right, is yes, we absolutely need a functioning website, right? There's uh, actually a whole bunch of new um, growth between nonprofits and uh, startups and um, uh, some of the tech industry and the government on how to kind of form new ways to, uh, to address people. Um, there's a really interesting startup out of uh, Cambridge going on right now that builds these um, digital boards uh, that people can see. Um, you know, we've done some pretty good work in town on like building out actually usable Facebook pages for for uh, communication. Um, uh, Stephanie, our town manager has, uh, sorry, Stephanie, our town clerk has a, has a uh, great one. Our town manager has a great one. But uh, we absolutely have to focus on our digital communication because that is where more and more and more of your residents are going to be on a daily basis and how they consume information. Thanks, Jared. And uh, same question for David. Are you clear on the question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> this time I am. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, the uh, the website, I use the website all the time. I'm always looking up for agenda. I look up for, you know, all kinds of information about, you know, what's going on in other departments and and so forth. And I don't see a major gap. And I, and I like the direction that I've heard from town manager and the clerk's office on things that they want to do to make it even better. I don't think it's that big a lift to go from a, a pretty solid uh, technology uh, infrastructure. I don't know if anybody knows it, but we invested a million dollars, 750,000 plus a lot of consulting hours, brings us very close to about a million dollars for our, our central technology that runs the town, it's called Munis. And uh, with that investment, it allows you to communicate, as was said earlier, uh, by a previous uh, speaker on the uh, way that you can pay the town. So you can actually get into an e-commerce capability so bills can be paid. You could actually have um, water meters that can actually take readings and have the information electronically reported back to the town so you don't have to send vehicles all over trying to pick up meter readings. And you could actually catch uh, problems where people have leaky toilets and sinks and, and you could actually get after uh, major problems with uh, the cost of water. There's also the ability on permitting. So imagine you want to put a project out to bid and there's a contractor maybe out in Worcester who can't just keep driving back and forth to our town hall, but they could actually deposit, you know, drawings and other things electronically for a permitting module. So that would make it so that we could attract more developers 
to say it's a great place to do business in scope and look how easy it is and how cost effective it is to communicate. So I think there's a lot of tools already in place that we could start to enable to do some pretty interesting things. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, so my next question is, um, I believe it's one that we got uh, submitted to, to, to the league. Um, so this question is for all four candidates. Every question is designed for all four candidates. Um, do you have any conflict of interest according to the law, yes or no? And what would you do if you did? So I'm going to start out with David on that question. No, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, what's the, you want to know what I would do if I did? What would you do if you no, did have a conflict? No, on a topic that comes before us, I would recuse myself, plain and simple. You know, okay. I do I do work in the private sector. Uh, the company I work for does provide services to the public sector. And if any of those services were ever contemplated as, as an option, I would certainly recuse myself and not even participate in the meeting. Thank you. Um, next up, same question for Jared. Uh, if you have any conflict of interest, uh, yes or no, and what would you do if you did? Uh, no, no conflict of interest for me. Uh, I would also recuse myself. Uh, you know, I work in residential real estate, uh, so there's not really much of an overlap in government um, uh, business there. Uh, so I can't really imagine one, but if I did, I would definitely recuse myself and uh, make it, uh, you know, well known. Thank you. Uh, Scott, same question. Well, I served nine years on the Board of Selectmen prior from 2000 to 2009. I never had a conflict of interest then. My, my wife is the town clerk and I sat on the um, finance committee for nine years. Not once did I ever sit on her budget not once did I even offer any information into that. I've always recused myself and that's all you have to do. All you do is remove yourself from the board. You can sit in the audience. Most of the time I would sit in another room. Somebody would have to come get me because that way you're not influencing the vote. You're not in their terms enjoying anything because that's what the real world word is used. And I'm sure you know that at the uh, state level when you get drawn into something that says are you enjoying something? So you just, all you have to do is, an old fella told me, if it looks like mud, you don't have to stick your hands in it to feel it. So you just stay away, recuse yourself, and leave all, all, all the stuff away from you. You just don't get involved. All my votes are made strictly for the, uh, the residents. I don't care about anything else. It's all about them never involves me so you just step away it's the safest thing to do thank you scott and last but not least steve i have no conflict of interest but i do uh have to say that that uh, the area is a lot trickier than, than i think some people uh may assume uh, uh i'm not speaking about any of the other candidates i think they probably know, know it better than, than most but it, but we do have um uh you know the, over the last little while, I've, I've had the opportunity to to ask whether or not I had a conflict of interest. Uh, one was in actually in the uh, the hiring of the town clerk, uh, because uh, for a while I was involved. But when when Mr. Kerr uh, chose to run, uh, I thought that that it was important that I uh, I not continue to pursue any really be involved with the, the hiring of the town clerk. Uh, if she got the position, I didn't want it to be to, to look. Uh, as though she was being given some favor. If she lost uh, the position, I didn't want her to look like she'd been punished. Uh, I think that was important. I spoke with the, the State Ethics Commission. They agreed that, that was probably the safer way to go. Um, so I think we, we are, that, that was a little bit of a uh, you know, question we had. We just wanted to make sure we were doing the right thing, uh, really by everybody. Uh, also, I, I was uh, asked to be the treasurer for uh, the uh, an organization, a local organization for special education. It's the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Uh, that one was very tricky. Actually, it got the, uh, the State Ethics Commission even a, a little bit puzzled. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they, they advised that I, I not do that. Uh, typically, you just you know you, you, where you where you think you might have a problem. It's important to pursue those questions and ask ask. Uh, we have we get free access to every every citizen has free access to call. The uh, state ethics commission and ask a ask a question of their lawyer of the day. 
They're very helpful and they'll help you uh, navigate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to um, urban renewal and development. So what can the select board do to facilitate the urban renewal plan to eliminate the vacant space in the town square and rehabilitate various properties in the area? Include green space plans, if any. So we're gonna start on that one with Jared. Uh, yeah, well, so if you look at the downtown area, um, you know, some of it is, it has so many overlapping districts and some of, it, and some of its zoning uh, measures. Uh, there's, there is a limit to what the board seems to be able to, to do, you know, statutorily. Um, you know, some of this is uh, within the realm of like planning board or the redevelopment authority. Um, you know, I would personally love to see kind of a green uh, space in that in that area. Uh, you know, I there's definitely talks about um, you know moving our some of the central buildings, some of the government buildings in there, uh, like the uh, post office. But I understand that's not happening anymore. Um, but and trying to create green space that that can be easily used. Um, so I think one of the central points of ha of this role is going to be trying to be build you know a coalition between the members of the board the members of the planning board and the redevelopment authority to try to ease out some of these um zoning restrictions that are going on and uh come up with a uh, a, a solution that's actually going to allow for for more uh, flexibility Thank you, Jerry. Um, so we're talking about rehabilitation, and uh, the, the next up is David. Thank you very much, Mark. Yep, I think it's an excellent question because the timing is so great. You have the uh, what we finally call the schmood is finally going to be dissolved once the town meeting approves this new district that they're calling the Stoughton Center District, the SCD. Um, much nicer sounding word as well. So. But with the, you see, the schmood today has so many different nuances and layers to it that it dis nobody was motivated to do any development in the downtown. It was a, it was a terrible uh, situation that nobody, you know, so we ended up with buildings the way they are today in the downtown. So with the redevelopment authority, as, as Jared was mentioning, in concert, you know, with the planning board and the uh, planner, the town planner who's putting together the, the new zoning, you now have an environment in which there's no excuse not to come to downtown and do some great work. So if you if you lay the groundwork for the new zoning, SCD, you combine that with the carrots and sticks that drive and motivate developers to do the kinds of buildings that we want, that's where, that's where the synergy comes from and that's where the uh the, the ball will start to to roll in, with the downtown so i think the timing is terrific and i can't wait to see it i know there's some questions i'm going to have about zoning they're talking about six story buildings and i think because they're going to have a setback on the top two stories that it won't be so much of a tunnel effect when you're trying to drive through i'm very curious about how that will look because um six stories sounds pretty uh you know, pretty city-like, if you will. But um, but I look forward to discussions on that, and I hope um, I hope they're fruitful because I think the timing's just right. Steve, you're up next. Do you feel comfortable with the question? I believe so. Okay. Uh, so I, I think everyone's on the right page here. That the, 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 this our zoning, especially with the downtown, has, has really been problematic. Uh, we've seen that some with some real uh, real projects. Uh, the Malcolm and Parsons being a particularly egregious one. It's a it's a hole in the center that's been there for far too long, uh, and most of the holdups have been uh, due to, to zoning. Uh, we've been able to, as the, as the current board of selectmen was able to get to, or select board, I apologize, has been able to to make the changes uh, necessary, and we couldn't do it by ourselves. This was something that, that town meeting supported uh, that, that helped these kinds of projects uh, get through. But but overall, we need we need to rethink our zoning. And if you'd asked me you know, when I was a kid if I would have ever been interested in zoning, I would have told you, you're crazy, but this is really is uh, such a fundamental question about what how you want a town to look, what you want it to be, is what how it's zoned. Uh, and the more I've, I've realized it uh, through just the practice of it, 
uh, the, the, the more I can see the, the wisdom in really being thoughtful and um, uh, careful with, with your zoning. Uh, green space is, is certainly something that, that uh, has a profound effect on a community. Uh, your ability to, to access it, or and even just to have it, the environmental impact that it has, just land you can't even use, just its existence is critical to the health, health of the community. Uh, when it comes to an area like the downtown, I find that uh, up until now, we've had a very difficult time moving any green space measures forward through town meeting, uh, typically because there's, there is, is um, we require like a two thirds vote to make a lot of those, uh, uh, to actualize a lot of those plans and getting two thirds of the community to agree on, on one thing has been a challenge and green space has suffered because of it in the downtown. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott, uh, same question. Are you clear on it? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, it's amazing that in 2004, I was talking with the Postmaster General on taking the post office. We were gonna, I took him up to a piece of property, which what, which was up on um, Park Street. And uh, I showed him a site for him. And at the time the post office was doing pretty good. So when I showed him what he could have up there, he was happy with it because all the post office trucks would have been under a giant overhang. They wouldn't have to push through there the snow and all that to load them. We were gonna end up with just a drop off center and where you buy um, stamps. The other side, I wanted to put the visiting nurses in there so the elderly could come and people could go in and have real visiting rooms with them and stuff they could do inoculations instead of doing them in the hallway or, or here and there. They would have had a real setup. What we really needed to do was to buy the property in the square that went cheap and that was Pachico's we could have put a parking garage there because that's the key to your urban renewal right now. There is not enough parking for all these dreams they want to build. If if they want to do something, you're going to have to take the Randolph property and, and make a parking garage out of it so that there's space. And if the fire department had gone up to the armory in 07, you would have been able to move dispatch out of the police station into that building and they would have operated there, would have freed up some space in the police department. These are ideas that I had that other people have now taken credit for. So as long as it gets done for the best of the town, I don't care who takes credit. You know what I mean? Okay, thank you. So we're at the uh, quarter of nine and I just wanna make sure we can get in one question uh, more. I think we can do it because we need about eight minutes for closing statements and kind of to wrap it up. So let's do, um, maybe shorten this one a little bit. Do you favor keeping with our existing town manager, town meeting form of government? Why, and if not, what might like what might you like to see instead? So keeping the existing town manager, town meeting, and why, and if not, what would you like to see instead? So I am gonna start with David on that. Okay, thank you, Mark. I, mean, I, I was watching League of Women Voters when they had a uh, seminar on, uh, on this topic. I actually, um, before I got involved with town meeting, I actually was curious about that myself. I always wondered, gee, why is it, you know, why is it so hard to get things moving and, and so forth? I wonder what other forms of government would make more sense, you know, and, uh, and I found a white paper. It was, uh, I believe it was Dartmouth, uh, where uh, students and faculty did a study on six different communities that changed from town meeting to various The Zoom gods are working against us today. <laughs> David is frozen for a minute. Let's see if we can get him back. Um, hopefully we can get David back. Let, let me go on to Jared and um, we'll come back to David, hopefully. Jared. Mark, can you repeat the question for me just so I- Sure, sure. Uh, the town manager, town meeting form of government, do you favor it or would you change it? And if so, how? Um, well, so I, you know, I come at this from a different perspective uh, where I am a town meeting member. I'm not, uh, not a finance committee member. Um, but so, you know, to be honest with you, no, I'm not, a, not a huge fan of the town meeting system. Um, it, 
you know, tends to be extremely inefficient. Uh, the a lot of the projects tend to get held up for one, five, ten years in many cases. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the best option is for for us and as a replacement. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can do it between, uh, you know, like what Randolph does, where they have a town council system um, and and a town manager. Uh, you have, um, you know, the mayor city council system, of course, and then the, the strong manager city council system. Um, I think we need to kind of explore all of them. Uh, I think we know right now that the current system in many cases is not really functioning very well because of its inefficiencies and how long some of the projects get drawn out because of it. Um, and I think it's something that we should uh, be looking at, especially as we grow over the next uh, couple of years. Thank you. Um, Scott, um, same question about the uh, former government, town manager, uh, town meeting. Do you like it? No. Or what would you change? I'm, I'm not going to waver on this one one bit. I appreciate the town, uh, the town government we have right now. I would not like to see, we have 168 reps, and that's from eight precincts. We would lose 159 voices in a sweep. You would end up with nine people, eight counselors and one, one uh, at large. The, the population is not growing in this town, so I don't know why we have to gear everything in this city type of mentality. We have lost 30, 3,200 people in like two years. We only have 24,800 and, uh, and a couple people. That's what the, the, the census is, so you can't dispute it. That's what it is. So I, I appreciate the town meeting way of doing things. I've been there since 1988, not just nine years on the finance. I've been in town meeting since 1988 in two different precincts in town. And this is where you learn how government works. You learn who your comrades are. You learn different things from other people who they are it's 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 a good place to start if you show up and i've been there like i said since 88 i you know who the players are you know how to work things you learn what departments are what and what they need i can't see the time i don't know what's left professor you're 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 done it said okay. stop Thank okay um, I'm going to go back to David. We got him back uh, on Zoom. So, David, uh, you, you, you go go for it. Thank you so much, Mark. To show you how vexing technology is, I work in the Internet business, and I even have problems with the Internet. So thank you very much. I, uh, so what I was saying is, is that there was a study done in uh, six different communities, and most of the communities are sorry that they changed. The, uh, I think one of the only towns, and it's been a while since I read it, was I think Braintree was happy that they converted away from town meeting. But most of the other ones are saying, we lost all the transparency. We no longer have a voice in, in the changes that we want for our town. And it's very, very, uh, um, it's a very rude awakening you get when you try to change, let's just say that. But on another thing, I get concerned when I see different um, people in places of, um, of higher, you know, office, you know, or in, you know, the boards that actually start um, making it difficult for other volunteers and whether it's um, other committees, other boards, and the intimidation that I think happens when, when there's uh, people who, who want something so much that they're willing to uh, make it extremely difficult, they actually slow things down. We had that happen with uh, the Malcolm Parsons. We could have had that thing built like over two years ago if the board had actually listened to the planning board. But instead, what did they get? They ended up getting a bunch of flack and actually called in with all kinds of questions about the propriety of, of their recommendations. Turns out, two years later, they end up adopting the very things that they were uh, chastising them about. So, you know, how could they go from saying, you're wrong for your recommendations all the way over to a point where they're saying, uh, you know, Oh, we, I guess we should have listened. Well, I think that has a lot to do with maintaining the integrity of town meeting when you get rid of that kind of acrimony between departments and boards. 
Sorry, I got to cut you off because we're close to the end. Um, let's go to Steve on that question. Do you remember oh, the question? I do. I do. Thank okay, you very cool. much. Uh, so uh, uh, I oscillate often uh, about this question. Sometimes I think we should go with something else. Sometimes we should stay with, with town meeting. Uh, ultimately, I think what you end up with is a, a, a trade off whether they pick one system or the other. And it's true of all systems, whether it's a computer system or, or a banking system or whatever it may be. You always ha have this, these trade offs between uh, security and your ability to feel, you know, sort of that something's transparently understood and your ability to be nimble in that system. Uh, your, you know, the idea to be able to move your banking, for example, to an iPhone or, or something like that uh, was a slow move because it was very difficult to make that a secure transaction. Uh, and so we see the same thing with, with town meeting. It is extremely secure. Everything is, is scrutinized uh, thoroughly. Uh, there are, there are, there's no place to hide you know, in, in, in this process. And for that reason, it's, it's very secure, uh, but it is extremely slow. It's very, very slow. You meet once a year, sometimes often twice a year, uh, and that's when you get all of your business done. Uh, it's not nimble. In a time like COVID, uh, where we need to be nimble, where there's a, 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 some issues that, that, that crop up that we don't have time to bring town meeting into, uh, having some other form of government would have been uh, really great. We, we could have had things done a lot faster. In the long run, I think that uh, there are pros and cons of both. Uh, I'm still comfortable with town meeting the way it is, uh, but I, 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 as I said, I oscillate. And sometimes I'm, I'm thinking we, we, we got to do something different because we're not moving fast enough and getting the things done that we need to get done. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. We're going to go right into closing statements, um, and we're going to start first with Jared. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for having me. Professor Lindy, thank you so much for hosting this and the league for having this tonight. Uh, and thanks to everyone here and watching at home. Um, I'm Jared Rose, uh, running for our select board seat. I'm a green certified realtor and a former state senate aide. I'm a town meeting member on the Municipal Ops Committee, um, the co-chair of our Cultural Council and a member of our Historical Commission. Um, what I think we really need is a future-focused agenda. Uh, how, we are, how are we addressing some of our incredibly skyrocketing housing prices? Um, how are we uh, building and meeting our carbon uh, neutrality goals and uh, helping protect our environment? Um, how are we listening to and working on constituent services and really trying to engage the public? Um, I think my experience really lends itself well to toward this end, and I think that uh, I will be an invaluable addition to this board. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jared. We're going to go right next to David. Thank you, Mark. And um, I'd like to uh, just say that uh, I, r I run in, the, in this town select boards run as nonpartisan. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. I run my campaign without the help of any party, not any state affiliation, federal. And my decision, think the way I'm gonna make my decisions is gonna be purely for the people who already live here in Stoughton. That's it, that's my only motivation for doing this. Whereas other people might be running because they wanna use a national platform and run on uh, a campaign that that could be better served in Congress. I'm not running for Congress. I'm running for select board. I want to just let you know that I'm looking out for the citizens who want to enjoy the rest of their time in Stoughton, whether you're a blue collar, low income person, or you're on a fixed income, and you want to just stay in Stoughton because you have a lot of pride in the town. I'm going to make sure that the decisions are not just talking about revenue for the sake of revenue, because when they say that, you should watch your wallet, because going after revenue just for the sake of revenue does not do anything other than cost you more money. You can actually take the new growth, all this new money that could arrive from sewer projects and every other kind of investment, and it can make an impact if you fix the things that I'm talking about. I'm gonna fix it so that when those monies arrive, they either give you new buildings that we need, better services or more services, or a tax cut if needed. If we can get to a point where things are so good because the impact of these new revenues is so great, it's time for those dividends to come back to the people. It's not, it's not for these lofty talk conversations about what could be if we just had more revenue. Revenue with the, for the sake of revenue is nothing more than a tax hike. 
And that's all I want to say, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, David. Let's go to Steve next. Thank you. Uh, again, Professor Lindy, thank you for, for, for moderating League of Women Voters. Thank you for having us and for sponsoring this. Uh, and also, just really, once again, I do want to thank all the candidates. I know that these, these uh, uh, debates, I think this was a very friendly one. They're not always that way. Uh, but but uh, you kind of come out here and uh, show people what you had, and I, I appreciate you doing that just as a citizen and also as a, as a fellow candidate. And I would be happy to work with any of you. Um, the, uh, the future of this town, we, we are in a... Uh, in, a, in a much better place than when, we were, when, when I first began on the board. Uh, financially, uh, we have a much tighter understanding of, of, of our, our spending, uh, but also I think we're, we're, we are working towards developing our culture uh, in a way that I think is going to uh, benefit everyone a lot better. Uh, during the time that I've, I've been here, I've also had a, uh, spent a lot of time, a lot of effort uh, cultivating a strong relationship with the school committee. And, and uh, as, as a parent, you know, it's important to me that the schools have access uh, and, the, and the support of the municipality as, as a whole. Um, uh, the future of our town, I think, really depends on some, some wise decisions uh, made right now that are forward thinking and, and uh, anticipate uh, where we could be uh, if, we, if we just you know, funnel things in the right direction, if we're, if we're thoughtful of our spending, but also thoughtful of the investments that, that we can, can be making. And the impact they will have uh, on our on our children, our children's children. Uh, I will leave it at that. But I thank you very much for your time. And I do ask for your vote. Uh, oh, if if you are happy with my performance and the videos I do uh, on a weekly basis to let people know what's going on in the town, uh, you know I'd love to keep on doing this. I, I, I've had a great experience uh, in every aspect of it, and uh, I hope to continue on. Thank you. Thank you, Steve and Scott. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Professor Lindy, Genesis, and, and SMAC, Mike Hammond and the group. Um, I'm a town meeting member since 1988 to the present. I did nine years on the Board of Selectmen prior, concurrently. It was tough too, through some of those years. I was, I'm finishing up nine years on finance. I did five years on the zoning board. I was on Stoughton Conservation. I was on Cedar Swamp Advisory Board, the Sewer Advisory Board, and Zoning Bylaw Review Committee. I have given all this time to the town so that I would be better person to know what's going on. I just want to say I will deliver the security and decision making that will only benefit the town. I'm a strong person with knowledge and dedication to represent you now. Together, we'll build the future. Everything is about the residents, the employees, and the services. I made sure when I was on the board, those came first. All the other stuff comes in time. Sometimes you have to rely on some of your, your um, employees in different departments, like um, the town planner. He has more strength on the downtown than a lot of people. I have a good background in building in construction. I understand a lot. I know about sewer and water. I've helped the town through s several things of that. I was on the chairman of the water committee. It's just, I ask you, please, for your vote, April 6th, Tuesday. And again, together, we'll build Stoughton the way it should be, in a prioritized, steady manner, not just throw the irons in the fire and spend money. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for your willingness to serve or, or your past service. I know it takes a lot of time and dedication away from family and I appreciate it. I've never been called professor so much in my entire life. I don't even have my students do that, but this was just kind of scratch the surface. We could have talked for another half an hour. There's plenty of issues in town um, and I really appreciate your service. I wanna make a mention that joining the League of Women Voters is very simple. Uh, the website is lwvss.org and I thank you for the honor of allowing me to be your moderator tonight. No interest in the race. I live in Bridgewater and uh, 
it is just interesting to me. I reported back in the day when they had newspapers, the little weeklies on the board of selectmen. That used to be high drama back in the day. So I wish everybody luck, and I know this will be on SMAC. Uh, all the way up until the election. We thank them for helping us to do all the technical logistics. And uh, I bid everybody a good night. Thank Take you. Take care. Good night. Thank you, Mark. Good night.